Okay, great. Let's just start. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So after uh, the opening, there will be a short overview of Horizon 2020 project, uh, our Enrich Let's Association from Marco, then the keynote speech uh, from Chaba, then short pitches uh, from the panel members, and after the after this a panel discussion, uh, question and answer session, and after this we will we will close our meeting approximately in two hours. So, Felipe, the world is yours. Thank you so much, Bella. Welcome. Good morning, if you are on uh, in Brazil or in the US. Good afternoon, if you are in Europe or in Asia or in Africa. It's an immense honor to welcome you today. I'm so glad to have you present today to uh, debate this so important topic, energy generation, renewable energy, smart energies. I'm introducing myself very quickly here. I'm Philippe Casapo. I'm the first elected president of ENRICH in Latin America and Caribbean, and which, which stands for the European Network of Research and Innovation Centers and Hubs for Latin America and Caribbean. And our purpose is very simple. Our purpose is to look for partnership, to bridge for innovation, science and technology between Europe and Latin America, Central America, so that we can design together the future that we really desire. And today we'll have the opportunity of doing that very concretely because we have the honor of welcoming very well-known and high-level experts on renewable energy, distributed generation. Uh, we'll have a keynote speech from Spada Sulok, who is from Budapest also. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll have a debate with Igor Ferreira from Brazil, Karina Medzlik from Georgia, Renato Povia from Brazil also, and Manfred Spitzenberg from Austria. So I'm not going to be too long. My purpose is just to welcome you today. To say I'm very glad uh, to have all you guys today and uh, desire to have a, a wonderful uh, meeting today. So now giving back the floor to the speakers. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Marco, who will introduce us the project. Marco, the floor is yours. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Bella. Thank you, Felipe, and all the participants. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you for such an important matter. Uh, my intention here is to also to be very quick and introduce myself. First of all, I am uh, the executive director uh, for Enrich INLAC in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we actually control and, 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 and manage the association in Latin America. The association is formed by big corporations, by startups, government entities, universities, technological parks, accelerators, incubators, funding entities. So it's a, it's a, it's a complete, let's say, ecosystem within our association. Uh, this is based on a project that was born in Europe, Europe 2020, and then Europe, uh, uh, Horizon Europe. And, and then we, we obviously are moving ahead on looking for ways, as Felipe mentioned, to develop innovation through research, technology, and internationalization, approaching and putting closer together Europe and Latin America, okay? And we do that besides this kind of, of uh, initiative that we are handling today. We also do that providing services to our associates, uh, to our members, and the, source, the services are related to communication of opportunities, are related to ex executive education, related to matchmaking. Maybe the most important thing that we do is matchmaking, is put together purposes of companies, of countries, of, of entities, and obviously uh, supporting with uh, multilateral funding solutions and also soft lending hubs, both in Europe and in Latin America. So this kind of service we provide to focus and to deliver our purpose, as Felipe mentioned, okay? So it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of this um, uh, event and support this, because this is the kind of thing that will enlarge our, uh, our reach in Latin America, in Europe, and in the world, and make possible to deliver according to our purposes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zita and Bella, for making it possible. Obviously, Sibeli also worked a lot for that, Leonardo, and all the people that are involved in the organization. Thank you very much. 
hopefully we had a we have a great session here the, the thank you marco thank, thank you. you for this introduction um, and now we will come to our topic just a few words about it some of you know that i used to be a physicist and at the end of my career, I, I worked with with, uh, with renewable energy sources. And my very, very first EU project was on photovoltaics. I think the way we use energy will make or break our future. Uh, and this is why uh, what we can learn from initiatives, what Chaba will speak about uh, distributed energy generation in the topic of renewable energies, especially in cooperation with, with Brazil and Latin America, where we have many, many renewable energy possibilities, is, I think, think uh, an essential part uh, of our cooperation and one of the pillars of our cooperation. Chaba, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm very really curious about uh, your presentation. Thank you very much, Bela, and thank you, Zita, uh, for inviting me as a keynote speaker. And um, of course, uh, greetings to the Brazilian colleagues as well. And now I share the screen. Let's hope it works. Please let me know. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, we see it. Yes. I'll be talking about uh, my favorite topic I've been researching and uh, making a startup about for about 10 years. And this is the Brazilian distributed generation. And um, especially I would like to highlight the investment opportunities. So the presentation will be from the investor's point of view a little bit. And also the, the new regulation, because this investment opportunity was really created uh, in the last two years by a new law and by some tax reforms that uh, created uh, something is no okay so let me introduce myself oh, briefly if i could uh, yeah so my name is chaba shuyok i'm an energy economist and um after uh, working in Hungary as an economist, I moved to Brazil and uh, started a PhD program in the area of renewable energy. And uh, during my PhD, I focused on distributed generation and technologies and business models that could um, enhance and, and make distributed generation more attractive. So um, I have both uh, an academic background in economics and business and also in uh, engineering and uh, specifically energy. So in summary, this presentation will be about uh, introducing a little bit what is distributed generation about in Brazil, uh, what is this new law uh, that uh, makes a good legal environment for distributed generation, what are tax incentives, and then I will move on uh, to introduce a new business concept and the platform we developed with Senai in 2018. And then uh, talk about some possible energy projects. So uh, we all know Brazil is a vast uh, solar power. And it receives much more sunshine and has much better uh, resource than, than Europe. So it's really suited suitable for um, solar energy generation, especially the Northeast. However, uh, the consumption is more focused on the, on the South, uh, around Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. So the regulator wanted uh, to form some uh, legal environment uh, that um, gives incentives of local generation. Uh, that is to avoid uh, transporting the energy from the Northeast uh, to the South. And the context is, of course, that Brazil is largely hydro power based today. More than 60% of the generation is hydro. And um, solar is getting cost competitive. And that means that uh, solar can complement hydro very well. In fact, uh, hydro can serve as a storage opportunity for solar generation. And of course, solar is also has the other benefit. It's uh, very environmentally friendly. friendly and um, it can reduce uh, the, the uh, difficulties with the transmission and distribution. 
But let's see which solar are we talking about, because um, there is uh, in the Brazilian legislation the micro, the mini, and the centralized generation. And today I would focus on the micro and mini, so more like rooftops and uh, small power plants up to three or five megawatt, depending whether it has storage or not. And this is the federal law, the 14,300 that was um, enacted on the 6th of January in 2022. So we have the first birthday of this legislation. However, I'm talking about this only now because uh, the ANEL norm 1059 was uh, only um, established a couple of months ago. So although we had a law, uh, this law wasn't really effective until the ANEL norm um, was published. But now with the ANEL norm, we can fully uh, utilize this new legislation. Before this legislation, we already had um, the 482 and the 673 uh, um, ANEL regulations. They were basically talking about the same distributed generation concept. However, um, with the law, the investors have a much uh, more secure uh, legal environment. So basically, this law uh, establishes a compensation system. That means that uh, each kilowatt hour generated on the rooftop or in a small power plant is credited uh, on the consumption side. This uh, credit is originally one to one. And we'll see in the presentation later that how will this be modified. And uh, now with the new legislation, there is a, a new concept introduced that these credits can be transferred and they can be also reused, um, especially in the concept of, of uh, associations. So this self-consumption uh, means that uh, you generate your own power. So even if you participate in a shared power plant, because that is also possible in Brazil, um, a group of um, residences or a group of small companies, they can form an um, association. Um, it can be a consortia or a cooperative also, but association is really the, the, the best form today because it allows the, the unification of private people and companies. And they, these uh, entities can uh, join and uh, jointly uh, produce their own energy in a power plant situated in the same distribution area. So because it's the same distribution area, it's kind of local generation. Now with the, with the new law, uh, the, the main uh, change compared to the previous legislation by ANEL is that uh, these small power plants do not have to pay the so-called demanda contratada. So there used to be a fixed usage charge because um, the distributors, the utilities consider these power plants as consumers, so they have to pay uh, this fixed fee. Um, in the future, they don't need to pay the fixed fee. However, they will need to pay a variable charge uh, based on uh, how much energy they produce. So um, the utility will be compensated, but this compensation will be um, about a, a lower amount and also a, a more fair amount. And we will see also that uh, at the beginning right now, um, there is a huge discount. It's almost a 100% discount on the distribution charge. And uh, year by year, there will be a reintroduction of the distribution charge. So there will be a gradual reintroduction of the utilities part. And also this new legislation means uh, that there is less bureaucracy and uh, there are also tax incentives. So uh, especially in Minas Gerais, uh, they were the pioneer, but today also Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro and Espirito Santo. So there is a tendency that more and more um, Brazilian states join this, this tax uh, um, allowance scheme and they allow uh, the, the tax benefit not only for residences who generate on the rooftop, but also for uh, um, remote um, uh, small uh, power plant generation. Zita, you wanted to say something or I, I thought you raised your hand. No, okay. No. Then let's move on. Okay. Then let's move on uh, understanding a little bit how is the, the energy tariff for the low voltage consumer. So we are talking about smaller consumers, not industrial scale large companies. 
these are more like residences and small companies, uh, they usually have this um, one third, one third, one third. So they pay basically one third for energy and then one third for uh, the distribution charge for the utility and then a third for taxes. Now, uh, with, the, with the tax rule, basically this tax part is one third is credited, so it's a benefit. Um, if you join such a scheme, you don't pay tax on your energy, on the energy that you can generate and inject to the grid. And the distributing charge is also has a huge discount, as I mentioned. So basically, you end up paying only for energy um, and, of course, a little bit of sectoral charges, but it can uh, significantly reduce your, your energy bill. And this is how the, the line B charge, so the, this is the utility part. This is what the utility normally charges for distributing the energy, uh, the, the so-called fee of B. And um, in the coming uh, seven years, it will be gradually reintroduced. So from this year, it's 15% what you would normally pay. Then uh, next year, 30, 45, and 60%. So each year you pay a little bit more for the utility. Because of course, uh, prior to this legislation, there was a huge debate in Brazil about um, how the utility should be compensated. Because it's not so much about the utility's income, but the utility has to re, uh, redistribute uh, this loss of income among the, the consumers who have no money to, to install such um, solar power plants on their rooftop or, or even remotely. So um, the utility said that it's not fair because um, consumers who, who lack capital will end up paying for those who, who install the, the, the solar system. So that's uh, why Anel and the, the legislators, um, they come up with this idea um, that um, slowly during seven years, uh, the distributed, uh, distribution charge will be reintroduced. Uh, and with this mechanism, it also means that during the first uh, four or five years that is the, the most important for uh, from the investment point of view, because uh, these power plants in general have four or five years payback. So during the payback period, you enjoy this uh, distribution, char distribution charge benefit. And, and uh, once uh, your investment is, is paid back, once you, you, you uh, could pay back the bank, uh, then uh, you start paying for the utility. And then uh, let's move over for the tax scheme. How this CONFAS and uh, the four states uh, legislated this. Uh, CONFAS uh, uh, tax allowance uh, exists um, since 2015, so uh, and that's a, a longer story. Uh, however, um, besides Minas Gerais, that already has this uh, more liberal tax regulation since 2016 or 17. Now, uh, even Sao Paulo and um, a few years ago, Rio de Janeiro and Espirito Santo joined the uh, um, a special scheme that allows this tax benefit uh, to be enjoyed by shared power plants. So these three megawatt, or if you have storage, five megawatt power plants that are substantial, also in terms of investment, it's three to five million euros. So they uh, do not pay uh, the, the the large tax. I mean, this this thirty percent tax um, in these four states. And that, of course, means uh, a much better payback and much more financial incentives for, for investors to um, consider this investment opportunity. So again, um, the, the, the one third we are talking about, uh, this is uh, a considerable, the, the ECMES especially is a, a, a big part of the energy tariff. So uh, in all Brazil, up to one megawatt, there is a tax allowance, but only if the generator, if the power plant is on your name, basically. So you have like a, a, a small company, not a small company, but mid-sized company, and you are running pharmacies. You have 50 pharmacies in a state, in Ceará. Then, uh, and you make a power plant, uh, a, a one megawatt power plant to compensate the energy um, and get the energy credits for these 50 pharmacies of yours, then you don't pay tax. However, if um, 50 small companies, different companies, different ownership, they join and jointly um, construct a power plant, then they do pay this tax. Um, and then, um, because this didn't seem to be very fair and very 
offering enough incentives. So then Minas Gerais was the first state who said, okay, we can open it also for uh, the association. So whoever is um, joining in an association and produces energy jointly in a power plant would not pay uh, the ECMES tax. And then Rio de Janeiro, Espirito Santo joined in a, a few years later, and finally Sao Paulo uh, from this year. So now uh, Sao Paulo is the, the next focal point for shared distributed generation. However, just like in the case of the utilities, it is also not all flowers because uh, the state also needs the income. So um, there is also this gradual reintroduction of the ECMES uh, in the coming years. So as you can see on this table, uh, right now until 2028, so in the next five years, exactly during the five years, the payback is the most important. You enjoy a 100% tax benefit. And then every two years, every two years, you, you pay a, a little bit, uh, once 20, then 40, and so on. So the tax benefit is gradually decreasing. And at the end, from uh, 2031, um, you do pay the, the, the full tax. Um, by, by that time, basically, you have free energy because you paid back the bank, you have no more financing outstanding on the power plant, so uh, you generate energy without any tax expenditure, or, um, capital expenditure, I mean. And of course, uh, uh, an innovation of this uh, legal system is the storage. Uh, the storage was not introduced before this legislation. And uh, the new law, the 14,300, uh, says that um, such power plants, um, small hydro, biogas, or even wind, so renewable power plants can be constructed up to three megawatts. However, if you, um, join it with the battery storage, then you can do a five megawatt power plant. So if you really want to enjoy the economies of scale, and there is considerable economies of scale between three and five megawatt, uh, then you can do that, uh, provided you you have battery storage for um, to store that electricity. And it's also very beneficial for the for the utility and for the grid because then you can store your energy during the day and release it uh, in the afternoon, early evening, when the demand curve is the, the on. So, and it also creates a new business opportunity because of course you are able to, to resell that uh, stored energy in the afternoon or early evening for the utility or, or um, um, energy trader on a premium price. So this is a double benefit. First, you can make a larger power plant of so five megawatts, and second, you can um, have a, a second business case of uh, selling the energy at the peak price. And then um, I talk about a little bit uh, about this um, innovation development we made with Senai. This was my company, Posol, uh, who uh, won an innovation uh, award from Senai and uh, we jointly uh, developed this uh, platform. It's a, a web platform, basically, um, with the objective of, of um, enabling these shared power plants. So the platform registers and uh, joins, virtually joins, uh, interested parties, both uh, residential and, and um, small, medium-sized companies, um, all in the, the, the B segment, so low-voltage consumers. And um, it uh, administers these power plants. So it's a very simple sign up process. So you can simulate um, how much is your economy um, and um, see the, the instant benefit. Um, the idea was to invite external investors and um, finance the, the power plant through maybe European or uh, Brazilian investors and then offer these energy, uh, the, the generated energy credits uh, to the consumers through the platform. And this is the administrative part of the platform. So each consumer can uh, see how his, his um, energy production um, goes and how he receives the energy credits from these power plants. So it's a very transparent and uh, easy to follow uh, platform. Also with monitoring, 
or it can monitor both the economic and uh, also the, the green benefit of his generation. And then finally, and this is the last part of the presentation, I don't know how much time we still have left, um, but uh, maybe if we have uh, three, four minutes, then I- uh, Chaba, you have little... time. Okay, perfect. Uh, a little bit about energy projects, because of course, all this legislation and these uh, tax benefits and even the platform is wonderful, but uh, but these things basically also the legislation in, in form of uh, an regulation and um, in Minas Gerais, at least, also the tax benefit already existed for almost six, seven years. So since 2016, this legislation is, is uh, in power in Brazil. It just didn't have a law. Now we have the law. Uh, and um, really during this, uh, this period of 2016 to 2020, when I was trying to make Kosovo a reality in Brazil, most investors um, said that they like it, it's interesting. However, it's also only viable in, in Minas Gerais because only Minas Gerais offer this tax incentive for shared power plants. And uh, that wasn't a large enough market for them. And also they said there is no legislation so ANEL can easily change the rules and then they would not have any um, coverage, any security. And that's why um, there were relatively few power plants, uh, distributed generation power plants in the form of shared generation. There were many power plants uh, for direct generation. So one company making a five megawatt power plants, mostly telecom companies, OI and Claro, they built um, dozens of these small five megawatt power plants, but only for their own consumption. But now it, uh, the new legislation and tax rule opens it for a much wider uh, circle of consumers. So we need to look into how to structure these projects. And of course, now, because it's uh, all legal and, and uh, economically viable, um, making energy projects is much more challenging than before. And here you can see uh, an ANEL report from 2019. So it was before the legislation, before the, the ECMES uh, tax rule. Uh, for the shared generation, this is shared generation, there were only 268 uh, consumer units or, or, or generators uh, in, in this scheme, while there were 11,000 uh, remote consumption. So the remote consumption, that means the same power plant, but only for one client, that was orders of magnitudes larger than the, the shared generation. Shared generation was basically just an experimental thing, and most of it was concentrated in Minas Gerais, and then a little later in Rio de Janeiro. And then here are the new numbers. This is two thousand. These are all um, present number from last week, basically, and uh, you can see that. Uh, Gerasao Comperciada, so the same scheme. Of course, it's still much lower than uh, remote generation uh, or, or, or the generation at the, the same location. Uh, that's, of course, by, by far the largest. But compared to three years ago, it's significantly higher. And I envision that this number will go even faster. So probably in three, four years, uh, this number will be more equivalent to the remote generation. So there is a very steep uh, increase in, in uh, shared generation. So these power plants that offer energy credits for a, a group of uh, consumers in an association. And of course, here you can also see later, we can come back during the discussion that most of these uh, power plants are solar powered. So basically the vast majority, 95% is solar. And then there is a, a minority, about um, yeah, a few percent uh, um, hydro power plants, small hydro. And then the rest is biogas. You can still yeah mention biogas is is uh, on on the chart, but the the rest basically is is uh, negligible. So you can see that really solar power is the the, the most important in you know, distributed generation. And uh, probably it will stay like that because the the other power plants are much more difficult to to establish, and uh, the projects are much more complex. 
So thank you very much for the uh, attention, and I'm very happy to uh, discuss this uh, <laughs> this issue about distributed generation and how these uh, five megawatt power plants uh, with storage could really benefit uh, millions of small companies and uh, um, even residential consumers remotely in 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 Brazil uh, that really has a structure a city structure of high rise buildings. Just think of Sao Paulo, uh, full of uh, 20 stories um, tall buildings, and there is simply no space to install uh, solar panels on the rooftop for everyone. So really, this model is very adequate for uh, such a scenario in Brazil. And finally, just a, a little more technological and philosophical uh, approach uh, that we see uh, in, in uh, the, with this legislation and in general in the work, uh, a strong tendency that um, the model is moving from centralized to distributed, so both in terms of energy generation, instead of having huge hydropower plants or even multi hundreds megawatts gas plants, uh, now we see uh, distributed generation more and more all over the world, small solar, wind, and biogas. And also um, the data uh, behind this is distributed. So we don't have that uh, very centralized uh, uh, data structure anymore, but also the, the data is uh, more spread out. So if you combine these two concepts, then you really arrive in the distributed small power plants with small data centers. And this is really the idea behind my, my startup concept to have uh, uh, blockchain technology that is a distributed ledger uh, with distributed small power plants functioning and then really you can connect uh, millions of uh, consumers with mm, tens of thousands of small power plants without really the need of a central intermediary. Thank you very much and, um, and uh, I'm very happy to answer the questions. Okay, thank you Chaba. Before we go to the questions, we uh, let's uh, go to the panel. Uh, those who, who were ready to to contribute with small pitches uh, to to this this uh, innovation talks. The first is Igor Ferreira. Igor, the the floor is yours. Okay. Uh... Thanks for your presentation, Saba. It's great to see uh, all the, the work uh, being done and the, the development. And uh, if possible, for my uh, small pitch, I would like to just present two slides that I have prepared just to show how aligned, I believe, we are with, the, with what Saba had presented. Just a second. Okay. So I'll just share my screen. Great. Okay, so uh, for this short pitch, I will just uh, introduce a little bit of uh, what we are doing at FOHA. And uh, in FOHA, we are accelerating the energy transition by working and acting on the 3Ds of the energy. And by 3Ds, uh, we are thinking about uh, decarbonization, decentralization, and, and digitalization. And by doing this, we believe that the main uh, technologies that will help uh, to make the system more flexible, uh, those are blockchain technologies for transaction, uh, IoT for data generation, as Xaba mentioned, the data is being uh, distributed in in many different ways. IoT is one one way of uh, having this data being generated by small uh, DR uh, components, and of course now the artificial intelligence is getting more and more uh, exciting, and we believe that will support the decision making process. And by aligning those three uh, technology and orient our solutions on that, we believe will. Uh, help the energy transition to, to go more faster uh, in our territory, and we expect the other global territories as well. So we foreseen that uh, 
of course, we are we are shifting in the energy transition. We are shifting from generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption to have a, a, a system that generates more flexibility for the consumer, especially the consumer. So if you take the, the Brazilian consumer, for example, uh, the consumption has um, lower flexibility when it comes to the flexibility you have on the generation side. So Brazilians, they have possibility to many different types of uh, energy generation systems like uh, biogas, uh, biomass power plants, we have hydro, we have wind, solar. So we have a flexibility on the generation side. But we don't have on the consumer side, so we are not allowed to choose the generator. Uh, we need to rely on the energy credits for the solar system, which has a lot of tax, a lot of issues that uh, uh, stop people to to go to those type of uh, uh, ranks, and this, of course, lower the flexibility. So we believe that the system needs to be more flexible, also on the consumers especially with the consumer figure, which is also generating uh, energy uh, on their side. And in order to work towards that, we are organizing POHA in different companies. So uh, we have POHA ETEC, which is our energy tech. It's uh, creating technology for the other companies. And Binks and Aqua, those are subsidiaries that are working towards delivering our solution to the market. And uh, at Aqua, we are working really hard on developing DR management through virtual power plants. So we are developing a software in order to create virtual power plants and aggregate DR and to manage those DRs, especially uh, connecting those virtual power plants to the energy market. So that's the main core that we are uh, supporting at Aqua. At Beans, uh, we have created an energy trading platform that was recently launched. So Beans is our uh, energy market, but for the this is designed for the big consumers, so not for distributed generation. But we believe that uh, uh, in due time, distributed generation will be connected to the free energy market. So we are operating this as a platform. And in this platform, we have a trading system that allows um, buyers and sellers to, to match their needs and also to manage all the bilateral arrangement, the contracts, all the system. Uh, it's uh, integrated to sell and manage the contracts. And at the same time, we have uh, financial products uh, like insurance and other types of financial products to support uh, the, the the buyers and sellers and traders uh, in order to build uh, security on their bilateral agreements. And also we have introduced uh, also uh, a DLT technology. It's not a blockchain technology, but it's a DLT technology uh, to make all these contracts uh, to become a smart contracts. And at the same time, we work at POHA in the term in the in the area of microgrid. So microgrid is a different way of integrating distributed generation. It's more focused on bringing energy uh, on the countryside and to bring that resiliency uh, on the countryside. So we are working to develop uh, the controller, microgrid controller. And the idea is to use the, the bioenergy that we have in the countryside, the biogas, uh, to create like local microgrids, to build resilience where the grid is not available or to allow the grid to have that resilience when the grid is, is failing. So we believe that the microgrids are a solution to deliver energy to the far uh, locations in the, in the Brazilian uh, side uh, rather than just putting all the grid uh, to the endpoints and to do this we have created two main solutions one is ex market ex market is a trading system that was created for web 3.0 uh, that that's because we use a dlt management 
call Fing chain, and these DLT allow a lot of nodes to interact and to close contracts using our trading platforms. But at the same time, every contract that is closed become a smart contract that is stored in this private network that we manage at Poha. It's using a Corda technology, which is a banking DLT technology, and that allows also for a settlement and liquidation of the contract. So we believe that that will help uh, when we have a lot of contracts coming from distributed generation. We need to have a, like a fast technology to close and settle the contracts. And AnuGrid is a it's our main platform for DER management. So we are managing we are managing integration in a microgrid system. The, the module from AnuGrid is a man, it's a microgrid energy management system. But when it comes to DER management, then we are developing in the AnuGrid platform a DERM system, which, which is a DER management system for virtual power plants. So this is mainly the, the technologies that we are putting uh, to work together this uh, scenario. And we believe that is really connected to what uh, Sabah uh, bring to us. DRs are a reality in our, in our country, but also we need to integrate that with a, with a free energy market, believing that uh, the, that type of uh, power plant will migrate to free energy market in the future or to create local energy markets. So we are really trying to figure out how to connect DERs into this scenario using that those main technologies. That would be my first pitch and contribution. Thank you, Igor. Uh, unfortunately, Karina could not made it from, from Georgia today. So our next panelist is Renato Povia. Renato, the, the world is yours. Hello. Uh, hi, Bella. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you today. I also have a couple of slides here. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Just give me one second. I believe you can, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Just give me a hand. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so briefly introducing myself and CPFL, I'm Renato Povia, I'm the Strategy and Innovation Director of CPFL. And who is CPFL? I didn't bring any slide, but it's a leading uh, comp utility company in Brazil. So we do have distribution, uh, also generation, uh, more recently transmission, and uh, trading business, uh, financial services, technical services, and so on. So basically a large utility, which the responsibility is to handle and prepare the grid for all this innovation that we've been uh, discussing here. And I'd, I'd like also to take a moment to, to congrats here, my colleagues that just presented uh, with some interesting uh, knowledge, both about the, the new trends uh, presented by, by Igor here for the, for the energy sector, and also Chaba, I hope, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, which pre also presented a good, uh, good knowledge and understanding of the Brazilian power sector, right? Uh, I'll, I'll present here a view on innovation more related to how the utility prepares the grid and the company for all these uh, uh, new trends that, uh, for example, Igor described it, right? So basically, when we think about innovation in CPFL, we think about process, products, technology, services, and business models. So it's a, it's a wide range of uh, trends uh, and, and topics that we believe it's a responsibility to create and also, again, uh, facilitate the introduction of these uh, of these technologies, right? Uh, during the presentations, they mentioned uh, uh, several times about uh, flexibility and stability and control of the grid. It's easy to understand that if you have a big hydro generation company uh, and a big transmission company, and the, the 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 consumer is just a consumer, it's much more easy to handle the grid. Instead, uh, on, on the other hand, if it much, it's much harder if the consumer has solar panels, electric vehicles, and other uh, uh, utility devices, the, the DERs that we talk, it's much harder. It makes the, our life in, as the utility company much harder, right? Uh, so also in CPFL here in the slides, we have some of the programs that we have engaging all the companies more 
related to uh, innovation culture in CPFL. So we have in lab where all the employees can give ideas and suggestions of uh, new innovations, technologies that we can study. CPFL Innova is one uh, initiative that is related to startups. So uh, as we just see, uh, uh, Forra and Gosol, these are some of the company, kind of companies that we try to bring closer to CPFL so we can try to work together. We also have Innovation Trade, which is basically training for the, for the employees, thinking about entrepreneurship, right? So preparing them for, uh, for preparing and designing new ideas and transforming them into business and, and new revenues. Uh, also Innovation Week, but I'm here today to talk about the R&D projects. So some of the examples of the big R&D uh, projects that we have, I believe most of you should be familiar with the Brazilian power sector, and we do have a, a independent fund, a big amount of uh, resources that we can, and we must actually, uh, there's an obligation for the company to invest in innovation. So I'll give you some examples of these projects, right? <clears throat> and basically we can think about five uh, big trends that are transforming the, the grid. So uh, I believe all, all of them were already mentioned, so, but we believe that uh, the, the solar generation, uh, the PV, all the renewables, also uh, the wind generation, electric vehicles, microgrid, uh, energy storage, and efficiency initiatives, all these technologies, they're transforming the grid uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a very, uh, fast, in a very fast way. And again, it's the responsibility of the utility company we don't create PVs, we don't produce PVs, we don't produce batteries, but it's our understanding is to follow this uh, evolution of the technology and again, prepare the grid for this uh, integration in an easy, in a smooth way, right? Uh, and here I'll bring a list of uh, some of the projects that I'd like to share with you. So we just see uh, the presentation here uh, of Chaba talking about the, the more recent uh, introduction and development of the solar panels in, in Brazil. We do start, we did start this uh, study in uh, 2012, is the, the first project we have here, is Tanquinho solar panel, solar plant. Uh, it's a one megawatt plant installed here in, in Campinas, close to the headquarters of, uh, of CPFL. Uh, and, but now it's, it's not innovation, but in 2012, in Brazil at least, it was a big uh, innovation. And so, and we installed this, and now this plant is uh, also installed using uh, in a in a DG following the, the the DG regulation, right? So this is the first uh, first technology. What is the let's say the the centralized power uh, solar plant? We also studied the decentralized uh, uh, solar plants, which is the in a, in a new project called the solar rooftops project. So basically, we've selected two hundred and thirty. Uh, houses uh, and installed these uh, photo uh, PV systems. Uh, in total, uh, we have uh, 0 0.9 uh, megawatt of uh, installed capacity. Again, the idea is that for the for utility company, one rooftop with solar panel, this is not a challenge, right? But if we have 230 solar panels in a single uh, region, so then yes, we have to worry and care about managing and, and ensuring the, the, the control of the uh, One interesting fact about this uh, project is that we installed this in a university, close to a university uh, uh, residence, right? So basically during the summer in Brazil, which is the, the long vacation, December, January, and February, usually several students, they will move out from this, from this region, but the solar panels stay. So the generation of energy in that in this moment, which is the highest because that's the summer in Brazil, would be much higher than the consumption. And, and this brought us a new challenge as the utility company, which is the, the peak of the grid was not in the regular flow. It was now in the reverse flow. So we were having an increase of tension uh, during the midday, like a mid, uh, at noon or 1, 1 p.m., right? So this, we had to rearrange all our processes and all our configuration of the grid to prepare it and to avoid any kind of problems. Just to also give you uh, another uh, interesting conclusion of this project is that whenever you, several consumers install the, the solar panels, the tension tends to increase, but the, the ones that have, the, the, the consumers that have the solar panel, usually they have their houses is, is well prepared they are usually richer and they, they, their houses and their, their appliances will be ready for such, uh, such increases in the, in the tension, but their neighbor might not be. So there, there might be the situation where one client 
several clients install the solar panel and the neighbor is the one that can have quality problems with the with our uh, energy and therefore also the the utility company also has the, these problems right so again the project to study the massive introduction of uh, 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 of solar panels moving on this is also one technology that we we, we are starting now uh, uh, we are evolving in these things understanding much much uh, newer uh, much more technology uh, for for here for the brazilian parameters which is to install and design a, a microgrid basically this is an evolution of a project that i'll show in the next slide which is the microgrid we want to build three uh, three of them uh, one of them in the in the same condominium that we just installed several uh, solar panels but we also want to do an, another one to to create another one in the university of campinas unicamp is a is a major u university here in, in in brazil and we want them to uh, basically for a microgrid you need some so generation source uh, and, and several controls in terms of equipment to handle. And so the, and, and this uh, would be able to uh, operate the grid of the university isolated from the rest of the grid, from the utility grid. This is a very uh, important, very nice project. We already had some, some tests about this in the, in the energy project. I'll show this uh, next, right? Uh, another trend is the electric mobility. Uh, here we also have some uh, some several projects. Again, we don't intend to produce or, uh, uh, or 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 sell batteries in electric vehicles, but the idea is to uh, in in include them in our operations. So basically, in the the first project here is in Dayatuba, where we are electrifying 100% of our operational fleet. We are talking here about almost 4,000 uh, vehicles in the in the group. So. We started with 19, but that, that's a start, right? Uh, we are studying uh, electric mobility services platform, basically a platform to handle uh, all the charging stations and the electric vehicles that we have in Campinas and then later in Caxias do Sul. Campinas is in Sao Paulo State, Caxias do Sul in the south. So the idea is to study uh, and, and have a real laboratory for, for this uh, usage of electric vehicle and, and the growth. Uh, a developing of a new charging station concept. This is also interesting. Basically, <clears throat> uh, we, we do understand that in, in the city, inside the cities, having charging stations is not a challenge because you find several, right? But if you go to the rural area or for long term for how, highways, for example, there you might need the charging station, probably a powerful one because no one will stay in, will stay in, will, in a stop of a trip for let's say six or eight hours to await for the vehicle to be charged. So, be, but but if you do that, you have to make a big reinforce in your grid because if you want to provide a, a high, a, a fast charging station, you will need a lot of energy from the grid. So what we are designing here is a charging station that is aggregated with a, a storage solution and a solar panel. So in this way, we can provide a fast charging without demanding too much. From the from the utility, and the last one is related to ES, ESG, this uh, Second Life project, which is basically we don't know exactly what you do with recycled batteries, so we we also want to study that. Again, the idea is to develop a methodology. CPFL is not going to provide such services, right? But uh, uh, and we do have some uh, important numbers of these projects so far. For example, we have traveled more than three hundred thousand kilometers with all these uh, EV fleets that we we already have. The sustainable campus is the project that we have in Unicamp that I just mentioned. So basically there we installed several uh, solar panels, <clears throat> also set a lot of uh, energy efficiency measures. We also have an electric bus uh, riding uh, for, the, for the students, right? And the operation center, which allowed us to, to obtain, <clears throat> uh, if I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm updated, but we were talking about uh, almost five million reais in energy savings for the for the university a year. So this is uh, an important impact, right? And the last one here uh, in terms of trends is the energy storage. Basically, we are studying uh, storage solutions in three levels. We have them in the in the wind generation, also in the transmission, and for the distribution, this is installed in the residential. Bella, you you probably going to say that I'm, I'm out of time. Yes, yes, two minutes, I would say. Okay, perfect. But but I believe that's uh, that's already my my last slide, right? Uh, basically, the most interesting part of all these projects is that they are all inserted in the same uh, in the same feeder. 
right? So we do have all these, we have solar uh, centralized solar panels, decentralized solar panels, electric vehicles, uh, charging stations, and the microgrids, this is all implemented in, the, in a region nearby, Unicamp and CPFL. So this uh, allows us to study and cross several technologies. The, the best example we have is that we, we do have the decentralized uh, solar panels that together with the, with the energy storage that was implemented in the same condominium. So in this way, we can balance and study all these technologies uh, together, right? Uh, I have a couple of, I would have a couple of comments uh, related to the presentations that my colleagues they made before, but I'll save this for for the Q and A in benefit. Yes, of for the for, yes for Thank the discussion. You. Yes, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renato. And uh, to be a very conservative and traditional guy, uh, we we gave this this uh, innovation today a very traditional Austro-Hungarian frame. So, Marfred Spiesberger, our Austrian colleague, has the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, Bela, for the invitation and for the introduction. Indeed, it is a pleasure being with uh, you and Zita and all the colleagues uh, from Brazil. So I'm I'm really happy to be able to present a bit uh, uh, an involvement in a in a project in a Horizon 2020 project mm -hmm. on uh, recycling of PV. So um, I myself uh, I'm a social scientist based at the Center for Social Innovation, a research organization in Vienna in Austria, but I'm living also in Belgium and I'm a prosumer here. So I have my, since three years, my solar panels on our roofs uh, combined with electric vehicle, which we are charging from, from the panels. So, um, yeah, well, I think nearly 10 years ago, we have been with Tita and, and Bella in an FP7 EU funded project on renewable energies. So a long tradition, <laughs> long friendship. And okay, now I'll go um, try to open my slides as well and share my screen to introduce you to the current project I'm involved. Yeah, I hope um, you can see that. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, well, um, we're all talking a lot about uh, installing PV and and uh, uh, that uh, we need to increase uh, production of solar energy. But, um, well, at some point, solar panels, they come to their end of life. And that is exactly what uh, this Horizon 2020 project uh, I'm involved in is about. So uh, this is Photorama project called um, Photovoltaic Waste Management, Advanced Technologies for Recovery and Recycling of Secondary Raw mm -hmm. Materials from End-of-Life Modules. Uh, it's an innovation mm -hmm. action, so a uh, rather bigger uh, project um, with about 10 million euros budget and which is running, well, it's running for uh, three and a half years um, from 2021 until uh, nearly the end of next year, 2024 still. We are a consortium of 13 organizations. Um, from uh, different European countries. The coordinator is coming from France. So it's the Commissariat uh, the Commissariat Energie Atomique aux Energie Alternative. So it's the biggest uh, French research organization on energy. Nuclear energy, it was in first place, but they have a very big branch now about renewables. And uh, this is uh, the branch we are working with in this project. Uh, you can see here uh, the allocation of the different partners over Europe. We have uh, also Norwegian partners from Sintef research organizations. There are companies from Germany, um, uh, companies from Austria, Italy, research organizations, um, as we are the Center for Social Innovation from, from Austria. Uh, but uh, there is also uh, the Soren, a French organization which is managing uh, the uh, the panels which have come to to end of life. So we really have in the consortium the whole uh, circular economy approach uh, uh, included uh, for PV panels. So there are producers, there are users, uh, there is end of life management, and uh, there are recyclers but also uh, users of the recycled materials, companies that reuse the materials. Um, 
let me get um, to uh, the next slide. So here um, you can see a bit the aims, the objectives that we have set ourselves in the project. Uh, we want to develop uh, yeah, new trailblazing technologies to implement a strong and reliable PV recycling scheme. Uh, there will be a pilot line built, uh, which is currently already underway um, in, uh, in Germany at our German partner company, Lux Chemtech. Um, we want to demonstrate the full circularity of uh, the re of PV panels, so the uh, materials that are that are recovered from uh, the PV panels, which are mostly valuable metals such as silver, indium, gallium, they will be reinjected as new materials, secondary raw materials, into into industry again. Yeah. Um, what we also want to do is to drive the market adoption of the technologies that are developed uh, in, in the project, strengthening the sustainable waste management actions under the European Innovation Partnership Framework. And uh, well, that is uh, the last point here is our role as social scientists. Probably you ask yourself, how come social scientists to the technology research organizations and technology companies? We are dealing with uh, awareness raising and social acceptance of the technologies. So we have done a big uh, stakeholder survey all over Europe uh, about the awareness of PV recycling. That was, um, uh, I think we have about uh, 300 uh, responses, uh, full responses from all different uh, European countries. We wanted to test a bit uh, uh, really how, how far are people aware uh, about all the different aspects of recycling. And there is a lot uh, of information to be done about that. Then we have also organized co-creation workshops, which have uh, used foresight methodology to um, uh, to specify the framework conditions in terms of legal situation, social requirements, uh, economic requirements for making recycling of PV panels a success. So that's that's mostly our role uh, as Center for Social Innovation. Well, here's the chart about um, how photovoltaic energy generation uh, will um, uh, will develop. So the projections. It's huge increases that are expected, but uh, only few people are still thinking about um, the the recycling of all the waste of PV waste that will be coming in the future. So that's exactly what we are tackling uh, in our in our project. So uh, the projections are that uh, well about 80 million tons of PV waste up to 2050 uh, 2050 will be expected. So that's a huge amount that need to be recycled. So uh, here is the strategy that we follow uh, in Fotorama project. Um, when uh, the end of life of uh, the panel comes after 25, uh, 30 years, uh, the first step is to disassemble uh, the, uh, the panel. So uh, the aluminum frame is taken off and the junction box and then uh, delamination part is um, is taking place. So that is the, the huge challenge where uh, colleagues are working currently. You can cut that off. Uh, there are different processes for that. Um, that was a bit too quick. I wanted to uh, discuss that a bit more. Uh, so when you have split up the panel, then you come to the materials recovery. You can uh, recycle the glass, the polymers, and uh, what's the most interesting inside is the valuable metals, the silicon, uh, the silver, and indium and gallium. So that's um, the third step. And then you reintroduce the materials uh, in, in industry. So that's what I wanted to say to, to raise your awareness. I would like to um, invite you to follow our project uh, on different social media. In first place, we use LinkedIn, but also our project website. Um, we will be uh, at uh, the European Sustainable Energy Week uh, in June, which is taking place from 20th to 22nd June in Brussels. So if you happen to be there, we plan to have a stand. We are certainly included in the policy conference where we want to discuss the uh, uh, PV recycling and its framework conditions that are required. So um, yeah, we would like, uh, we would, we look forward to welcoming you either in Brussels. Uh, another opportunity will be in September where there is EU PVSEC conference where we also plan to have a workshop. So thanks for that and any questions most welcome, of course. 
Thank you very much, Manfred. And now I open the floor to the questions. I would like to, uh, to ask at first the audience if they have any questions or comments, because I, I, I realize that Renato ha has a comment or question. But at first, let's go to the audience. You had already the floor, the panelists and the presenters. Dear colleagues, dear participants, anybody want to ask something, add something? Just to make it maybe more attractive, let's start with Renato. You had a question or a comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bella. What, I'm, what I would um, mention, and, and, uh, and, and maybe also uh, open here for, for another contributions, uh, is that in the in the in the keynote in the keynote speaker presentation, uh, they talked the, a lot about the the incentive, the tax incentives that we've been uh, observing here in, in Brazil, and this is a fact, right? Uh, this is something that uh, uh, we we do have uh, both the tax incentives and the discussion about the the demanda contratada, as as mentioned, which is the 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 fix the minimum minimum payment of the of the energy bill. Which is uh, also uh, uh, a technical subsidy for for this uh, for this market. Basically, what uh, I would uh, uh, comment and maybe also uh, uh, open here for discussion is that what we are facing here in in Brazil, the solar generation in Brazil is a reality, right? Uh, we already have 26 gigawatt of uh, of solar panels. Most part of it coming from the DG uh, DG format, <clears throat> uh, but but this kind of uh, uh, tax incentives and, and subsidies, this kind of law changes, they may bring also some uh, imbalances in the in the in a sustainable development of the market. <clears throat> I'll give you uh, I'll share one data with you, and maybe we can also discuss about this. But as I mentioned, it, so far we have 26 gigawatt of solar uh, uh, panel, solar installed capacity, solar generation installed capacity in Brazil. Only in the last three months of the year of 2022, which means the end uh, or the beginning, or the beginning of the end of the of the subsidy, we had we had uh, cus, cus, uh, customers requesting 32 additional gigawatt of installed of uh, of solar generation. So, in uh, in more than 10 years, we have now 26 gigawatt installed. And only in the last three months, we had 32 uh, additional requests of uh, 32 gigawatt of additional requests. This is not installed, right? That's requests. But this uh, shows how important this kind of, uh, of change in the, in the legal and in the tax this, uh, this can be. Uh, I'll, I'll, what, I, what I could hear for, for discussion, maybe uh, our colleagues here that are from more mature markets that, uh, that, than we do here <clears throat> is... Uh, uh, what kind of impact these kind of uh, of things can bring in terms of the logistics? I mean, uh, uh, import imports of, uh, 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 of of solar panels and installment uh, install in the installation of them. I mean, how do you see this? And if you have these kind of events uh, or if effects in uh, in other markets? Some answers to this. Anybody? Well, Bella, I, I would I would just like to add to that uh, doubt that Renato brought up and bring an additional variable to the equation. What about by the experiences of the other colleagues and especially from Europe or other parts of the world, not only the, the points that very, very valid points that Renato brought up, but also some bottlenecks related to materials, to, 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 raw, uh, to, to equipments, to install capacity. I, I would like to ask if this is also an issue or was an issue related to solar energy and to wind energy, uh, windmills, uh, related to limitations on equipments uh, and, and uh, to install the capacity. Brazil obviously has a huge potential, but uh, are those uh, threats for the, this, this, uh, this potential, let's say that Brazil has? Just additional to Renato comments. There are some very interesting examples. Um, uh, uh, for example, in Hungary, uh, two decades ago, windmills, uh, we had much more than solar panels. For, for some reason, uh, it, 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 uh, the investors invested uh, in, in windmills, uh, but this 
Uh, you can you can see them everywhere on the Austrian border, but only because of tax intensives, and they ha they had a lobby uh, to reach to 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 sell this 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 electric current quite expensive. Uh, however, we live in a valley, in a valley, in the in the in the Carpath Basin, so the wind speed is not very high, but we have a lot of sun, so it's very interesting that we started. Because of missing tax incentives, uh, with solar panels much, much later, at least a decade later than with windmills. Now, the, the, the share of, of, of solar panels uh, is, is much higher. And some, I would say, policy or politics closed investors are starting to invest in that. Uh, it's sometimes a threat uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the small investor, to the, to the citizen who wants to have uh, a solar panel. Uh, for example, on, on his roof, because if, if, if there are too many, then the state uh, steps back from from uh, from uh, supporting solar uh, power and uh, giving next tax intensives. So now, for example, we are in a, in, a, in a situation that those private persons who try to, uh, to want to install such panels, they can do it, but they they have no no special advantage in this. Only that that they can produce some some electric current. Some other examples. I would like to add to this discussion. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I believe the, the the free energy market it has a key role in addressing uh, this type of distributed generation. Uh, today, the the major incentive that we have to bring the return on the capex investment is the tariff. And we know that the tariff has a lot of uh, things that compose that tariff, a lot of taxes, a lot of uh, fees, uh, Taba, uh, bring the, all of that uh, figure to us. But uh, in reality, the, the tariff is increasing a lot in Brazil over the last years. That's why the return on the investment is improving because of the, the price of energy for the regulated sector is, is increasing but at the same time we we are also opening our free energy market in brazil and and somehow i believe the price market should uh, leverage the return of, of the investment on, also on the distributed generation so uh, in my view at some point uh, there is going to be a need for all these distribution generation to move to local energy markets or maybe to uh, the the free energy market and 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 to be competitive against other type of uh, 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 like uh, generators uh, and uh, at this point i believe we will leverage better the price and the return of the investment the real return of the investment that those solar plants have so this is just a small contribution. I, I believe the the way that we have built the the the, 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 the distribution generation expansion today has an end of life that will come, and the market need to address by by the price market. So that that's the the way I believe it should move forward. Thank you, Igor. Some other opinions. Chaba? Yes, sir. Let, let yes. me add a little I opinion to, to uh, Renato. Thank you, Renato. First of all, a very insightful and, and fantastic presentation. And of course, this is uh, today the, the biggest deb debate, this huge uh, increase of, of uh, connection licenses and, and imagined projects. Uh, and this is really comes down, in my view, to human psychology. Because, in fact, this possibility existed for the past five or six years. I mean, I was doing um, <laughs> all I could with my marketing background to raise attention to distributed generation and try to convince investors, uh, both at uh, um, investors' pitches and energy companies and foreign investors and European Union. Look, this exists in Brazil. Okay, there is no law, but there is a regulation. There is tax incentive. Let's do it. Fantastic. Three, four years payback. Come on. 
I mean, and not only me, of course, there were hundreds of startups and, and uh, many developers trying to do this and uh, with little results until 2020. I mean, it's, it's really an exponential curve. Now, however, in the last minute, when something is taken away, when you were offered the chocolate, you didn't want it. But now that the chocolate is going away, then everyone wants to grab on this. And then there was a, a, a reverse marketing. They said, okay, uh, the, the utilities or the state or whoever, like an evil uh, um, Dagobert uh, will come and will uh, tax the sun. You will pay tax on the sun. That was the, the, the marketing slogan. That is, of course, com complete nonsense. I mean, no one is taxing the sun. The due uh, uh, fee for the distribution of the energy, the, the utility cannot work for free, of course. I mean, someone has to pay to maintain the grid. I mean, the utility can finance it to the point, and after that point, other consumers have to pay for it. So, but on the point when the le new just legislation came out and said, okay, you only have one year, and after that year, we will start gradually reintroduce the very natural utility fee. Then suddenly alarm was going off and everyone uh, called their uncle and the cat of their uncle to, to get some finance. And suddenly um, landowners uh, jumped in and, and uh, made funds available, at least uh, security for financing. And now we have all this doubling of the capacity that was large to begin with in three months. But this is, this, this is only greed. This is only uh, developers greed to do it, and most of that won't be even financed. Most of that won't be viable for technical issues. So uh, I, I don't think that this will be all built. Maybe one third, or if we are lucky, half of that will be built, and the rest will just expire naturally. So I think CPFL can sit back, but of course you are sitting on the, the, the biggest uh, minefield now with the Sao Paulo joining the tax scheme and uh, the, the double effect of the, the new law. Of course, CPFL, who is a distributed uh, this, uh, utility company in Sao Paulo, uh, your situation is, is especially difficult, unlike NL, because NL is, is in the center. I mean, in the center of Sao Paulo, you can't really, you don't have space, but CPFL is on the countryside of Sao Paulo where you have space and you have uh, great opportunities. So good luck to you. And I hope you can make business because you will need someone to manage all these power plants. <laughs> Well said. Uh, this is this is a real challenge, and it's very exciting. I, I'm curious how this will be solved and how 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 uh, this this will happen in in the future. Uh, I asked the audience maybe some questions or comments. Manfred, please. Yeah, I think. Uh... Just to mention a bit the European situation that we are having, I think uh, what we experience now is a limitation of installers. So all people are trying to install um, PV as much as possible, which is especially fueled by, well, um, the Ukraine crisis. Yeah? So uh, everybody is aware uh, of fossil fuels, energy price rises. So we see huge uh, demand for installation. Um, yeah, but the but the bottleneck uh, is is really the installation companies. So um, currently, not so much. I think materials and equipment, what what was mentioned before, but uh, it is taken into account now. So that materials in the future, uh, it's it's going to be a huge challenge. That's why this recycling and um, recovery of raw materials from the huge amount of PV panels uh, has come to the agenda and then several projects have been financed uh, by the European Union um, through the framework program, uh, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, in this field. So it's a, it's a huge issue for, for the future here. Thank you, Manfred. Was there comments? Questions, reactions. 
I have another uh, comment. Yeah, the floor is yours. Feel free. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting uh, what uh, CPFL is doing. And, and Hannah to just show us a lot of uh, projects that are based on our R&D program. They are actually testing a lot of technologies and, and how that how those technologies interact in between them. And of course, uh, PV is it, uh, it's increasing a lot it, uh, for, for us. It, this is a there's no return on that because the tariff is, is not going to decrease the price of the tariff. So the return of the investment can be uh, a little bit more difficult for the future, but uh, that doesn't mean that the tariff price is not going to increase anymore. So if it's going to increase, maybe the, the return of the investment is, is, is going to be kept. And uh, the, the real challenge that I believe is going to, for the future is how the distribution companies, the utility companies will manage new business models to address those DRs and to integrate that in the, in the utility uh, network in order not to decrease the, the, the service that is provided. And uh, it's, at this moment, uh, everything is new, I believe. So there's a lot of in, in new players, especially startups, installing uh, solar panels. But what, what I believe is key is how to integrate that, how to secure that the distribution company will have a business model to explore. So it's not something that, uh, uh, I mean, we don't need the distribution companies anymore or the utility companies. Uh, those companies are going to be needed for future. But what's going to be the key role for those companies? Are, they are going to be DSOs. Uh, we are going to have TSOs. So all those figures, they need to have like a regulation in our country in order to have a secure path to follow. And this is under discussion. Uh, Aniel is discussing that. Uh, I think that the, the regulator is a little bit lower than the reality on the market because the expansion of the DR is, is being way more faster than the regulation talks. And this creates those gray zones where we keep the discussion kind of uh, trying to figure out uh, where to push the direction. But uh, what we see from uh, more advanced countries is that there's going to be uh, new figures, new operators. So an operator for the distribution company with a different business model, uh, which is sustainable in order to operate the network. There's going to have new players like the, uh, the, the, the solar PV inst installers, the, the PV <clears throat> that needs to be integrated. And then I think it's just a matter of time for those uh, players starts to, to, to appear. I believe Kosol is going to be one of them. I hope Koha is going to be also one of them. And at some point, we need to figure out how to work together in order to keep the business running, to keep the network running. So I think the, the first discussions are more difficult, but uh, at some point, we need to kind of converge to the best practices that we are seeing from Europe, from Australia, from other advanced countries, and try to figure out which role we are going to play in that sense and, and kind of try to some efforts in, towards the, the network benefit, the customer benefit. Because at the end of the time, at the end of the day, he's going to pay the, the bill anyway. So we need to offer them new services, maybe, uh, energy as a service, I, I believe it's going to increase a lot in that sense. And it's just a matter of time for the players to figure out uh, how to play together. Thank you very much, Igor. I know it sounds like a phrase, but in, in my opinion, if you want to save our environment, then cooperation is much more important than, than uh, competition. Well, I couldn't agree more with Igor. Thank you very much for uh, this fantastic speech. In fact, I was trying to do this uh, since 2017. I, I, I lost count how many times I uh, pitched utility companies and explained what is gonna come. 
I, I told them, look, uh, this is a, a, a legal situation. It's you, you, you won't be able to to revert it. This is gonna come. The only question is how you adapt to it. You either uh, cooperate with startups or you develop inside your company that may be more challenging, um, but maybe you have the position to build up a stack and you have the, the time to prepare for it because it was in 2018, 2019. I was basically pitching all the utilities. Zero utility made a contract with me. And only a few utilities made with, with Igor. And th that was also money from R&D budget, uh, especially reserved by Anel for this purpose. So um, I, I don't really understand. I, I explained to utilities, look, you, you're going to lose these consumers. You're going to lose millions of consumers, and you are in the situation not to lose them, but to revert them and enter into the distributed generation segment with platforms, with IoT, and applying technology and applying a new business model. You could keep your clients, offering them uh, only the, the discounts that is the, the ECMS, the, the tax benefit, basically. It doesn't cost you anything. You can keep the, the clients and make virtual power plants and uh, manage these virtual power plants with, with forward technology or with COSOS uh, platform and a few others. It's, and, and until now, I don't really see any major uh, Brazilian utility company really implementing something like Origo did. And uh, the likes of Origo are popping up and they are increasing and they money is pouring over them and utilities just witness uh, the, the severe loss of uh, client base. Yeah. So I, I hope I, this will change now. I, I, I would just would like to add on, on Kassab's comment here because I, I saw this movement. I think we both saw this movement coming and uh, at the first uh, the first insight was how to actually provide funding for that to happen. And we as entrepreneurs, we, we seek for the venture capital as a, a way to have funding for our project. And of course, I think we were kind of, uh, we, we have succeeded on at least some amount of funding for private companies, for, for, for the private sector, like private equity, uh, for seed rounds and, and things like that. But uh, we need to rely a lot of, on R&D money. I know that myself, I have raised at least the R&D money with two utility companies in order to develop the main core technology that we apply at Binks. Uh, and now we are moving to a different phase. So we are evolving that relationship that was based on R&D. We are now evolving to uh, corporate venture capital. We see that utility companies, uh, they have kind of realized that this is a, a no returning movement that is happening. But at the same time, they don't have the, they really don't have the internal uh, possibilities to create a, a movement to follow that. So now I see that some companies, especially the private companies, the private owned companies, they are moving to corporate venture capital. So they are creating a CVC fund, and they are raising money for CVC uh, funding, and they are starting to pour a little of that money into the startups. It's a movement that is happening. It's still on the early phases. Uh, I know that because I have already raised money with CVC, and it's uh, it, it, it takes more time. You need to have like a, a, he, a huge alignment on the corporate strategy from their side. So you need to kind of play together with them and then align your startup strategy with their strategy and then uh, things starts to align. And the other way is companies like uh, Aurigo, which receive a lot of uh, uh, venture capital money and they are very good at that. They are very good in raising that money. We know that, but this is not going to change the fact that we need to help utility companies to find a new business model. And we as, as startups, we are very good on that. We are very good on finding the niche markets, the flaws of the, of the systems. And then we kind of operate on that sense, but using their corporate uh, fund to kind of bring new business model to work together with them. That, that is the way that I see is going to work at least for the next phase 
and uh, I believe that we have like a, a, a running that is happening on that sense that is going to provide funding and uh, uh, innovation for the next like five years at least. And then a next phase will come maybe with the players already set up and then we are going to see a different phase. But at least the, this is the, the way that I see the market shifting not the not the way that we figure out. I think uh, we're expecting different, but I see the market moving on that sense, especially with the corporates together with the CBC funding. Yeah. Thank you. Can Can I just make uh, one one short comment? Of course. On on, on what was said. Uh, uh, and, and and I don't want to be defensive here, right? But uh, but let me just propose one one thinking about this, which is the following. Uh, I, I heard you were saying uh, that the distribution company must understand what's the business model, right? Or new future business model. I'd like to make one uh, one, uh, one one comment on this, uh, which is uh, the, the distribution segment, the, the, the distributor. It's very regulated, right? Uh, and, the, and, and the incentive we receive for the distribution company is keep the grid stable uh, and the, the energy running, right? Uh, uh, if in our, uh, even in the regulation model, uh, there are incentives for, uh, for innovation, for example, the, the R&D funds and so on to be more, uh, more effective. Uh, but it's, it's something that we, uh, I, I believe the regulation could also incentive more new business models. What I'm just trying to separate here is that usually when we talk about a group like CPFL or like Enel or Neo Energia, uh, the, the, big, the, the big integrated ones, usually you have the distribution company and you have a service company or a, a, a trading company. Or, and, and these business, although they are in the same group, they're very different. Uh, they are very and and even there is a, a, a strict regulation that you cannot share information uh, uh, in between these two bits. So I'm just bringing these that uh, I believe it's clear uh, at at least what for what we have now, right? The distribution business model is op build, strengthen, improve, and operate the grid, right? That's the of course taking care of the clients and and so on, but. But that that's the the, the big the, the the key the core business model, uh, and the innovations the, the innovation in terms of not in, in terms of technology but the innovation in terms of business models. This would be you in, in, from from the big groups from the integrated groups I know usually is outside the the, the distribution business, right? Uh, I I think that this does not uh, uh, the idea here is not to explain or to be defensive but but just to, to present to you that. Even internally, we do have an important segregation, separation of these uh, these different uh, trends and the way we deal with this uh, uh, energy transformation, which I believe, I mean, uh, the idea is to, to provide a better service, more stable, cheaper to the company. And for this, we would need to improve and, and design new business models. Right? Uh, I'm just saying that uh, for the distribution business, this is quite uh, limited from, uh, from the regulation perspective. Thank yeah, you very I much. Completely, I completely uh, understand, and uh, of course, there are certain limitations. However, there is CEMIC, and of course, CEMIC is facing this problem for a lot longer because the, the tax rule allows in Minas Gerais uh, much longer the same business model. Uh, but CEMIC quickly created CEMIC SIM, and of course, it's a subsidiary, it's, it's not their core company, but probably CEMIC SIM is fully owned by, by CEMIC. And uh, and then there is there are companies like Raizen who who isn't even a utility company. I mean they are uh, sugarcane ethanol producer and and owner of the the Shell gas station network, and they are rising to be one of the biggest uh, distributed generation power plant operators. And uh, I risk in ten years might overtake some of the the incumbent utilities in this segment because they connect all over Brazil. So. In fact, CPFL is, is um, of course, always uh, has, has the opportunity to open a subsidiary and uh, separate this uh, DG business and, and do virtual power plants, in my view.
Thank you. Further comments, questions? Bella, I would just like to tell that uh, I am in Brazil. I am uh, here and very interested in, in, in spreading the matchmaking and spreading the, the knowledge among us. So, so uh, please count on and reach in luck and, and, and my office here in Brazil to, to formalize any kind of contact or any kind of further discussion that you might have. So Enrich is, is here for you. And if, if I may add, uh, uh, we are here for further uh, cooperations in, in, in different projects. It can be uh, a business project or it can be uh, an EU project or UN project. So these are the, the fields where there are some supports on EU or, U, or UN level. We should look for them. We should cooperate uh, now in the future. Some questions, comments? Maybe it's too early to speak about funding and further projects, but maybe in a, in a few weeks or a few months, we can, we can do another talk very directly about uh, how to proceed in, in this topic. If I may, I, I would have a question for Manfred. And uh, Manfred, thank you very much. Very informative presentation indeed about the recycling of uh, the, the PV panels. And uh, of course, the world is going to face this, this uh, challenge. Uh, do you know uh, any numbers? Do you know any economics of, of this uh, recycling? Is it uh, currently viable? Is it a business case? Or is it something only uh, possible with subsidies? Well, that's uh, indeed a challenge. Huh? <laughs> it's not viable yet. Uh, in well, in France, I think they are soon becoming viable. But uh, yeah, it's for the future. That's for sure. Uh, when uh, the quantities uh, will be much higher, um, the the challenge is that uh, we need also more regulation from EU side because um, it must be. Uh, our well, our interest to recover these valuable metals from uh, from inside the PV panels, and then it will be much more interesting. But uh, uh, the challenge that we see also in our project is that uh, the uh, technology is there to recover the valuable metals, but it's still uh, rather costly. So uh, uh, we need some regulation from EU side uh, that also the recyclers take it up uh, as a business case in the future. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge indeed. And how about reuse instead of uh, recycle? I mean, a solar panel, panel, even after 30, even after 40 years, it still produces about 50% of the nameplate capacity. I mean, it, it doesn't fully discharge. So maybe after hundreds of years it does, but even if it only produces 50% in Africa, where there is no electricity at all, if they receive donation or, or extreme cheap uh, use solar panels from uh, a decommissioned um, utility scale uh, solar power plant, I mean, that could be uh, free electrification of continent. How about, mm -hmm. uh, you, do you make any comparison uh, calculation in, in that regard? Uh, well, we... We ha I have no calculations for you for that, but uh, reuse is a topic indeed. Uh, we see it with our French, uh, well, which is the mon monopoly, French uh, partner Soren, which is the monopoly for collecting the used panels. And they try uh, to uh, reuse them. For example, at bus stations, uh, they put um, the, the used panels just yeah, to have enough electricity for the time indications and stuff like this. So there are some, uh, there is some experimentation with this. Uh, what we also know is that there is some export from Europe of used panels to Asia and to Africa. Uh, but uh, well, it's not really tracked what is happening afterwards. No? So that is uh, indeed um, uh, an interesting issue for, for further research. Huh. Yeah, I, I do know a little bit about the wind because uh, I don't know if you are familiar that uh, wind towers are now largely decommissioned in, in Western Europe. 
because what happens is the environmental license is uh, almost impossible to obtain as there is a limited uh, physical space to install these onshore wind farms. And what the German and French developers do, they decommissioned the, the two three megawatt towers and instead they built a, a 10 or a 50 megawatt new tower in the same physical location. And what we do now is uh, figuring out how to export these uh, sometimes 10, 15 years old, but fully functional and, and um, really easy to, to repower uh, turbines for instance to Latin America. And there is a very interesting market case uh, or, or business case of uh, exporting German wind turbines to uh, Brazil and then use it for distributed generation and uh, generate uh, much, much cheaper energy than with solar panels, especially new ones. So this is really challenging because if if you if you go a step further, then in the first step you help those who are less developed, and then if you can track this procedure, you could do the deconstruction somewhere where the labor force is cheaper. I had this example what you mentioned, Chaba, in in Transylvania, where in a very remote and poor area, they bought a second-hand biomass uh, burning apparatus from Austria. 20 years ago, and it functioned very well. They had always a problem with 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 bio waste. It it it, it was it was burned uh, just from self. It, it 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 was a really problem for 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 everybody. And from after they bought this second hand uh, biomass burning apparatus, they they could heat the the the, uh, the police station and and the nursery and the school free of charge. So the, the, these are possibilities. Sometimes you don't have to go very far. Maybe the next step is then go to Africa. Important is that at the end, it is waste. We have the waste and we have, have to be able to handle it. And then uh, we can help them. Once we have these different aid programs, uh, we can use the know-how the, the know what we developed, developed, how to deconstruct it, uh, not, not to harm the environment at the end. Yeah, the, the benefit in case of the, the wind uh, turbines is that uh, with a very viable, technically viable uh, repowering method that our German partners do, they basically disassemble all the gears and all the mechanical components and um, reinstall it uh, as if it was uh, made in the factory. And with that uh, technical operation, they give new life to these uh, 15 years old, 20 years old turbine, and they can be used for again 10 15 years at least until a, a major maintenance is needed so um, with solar panels of course you are more limited with with uh, renewing it but um, yeah there is certainly a market for for energy generation when it's used I understand your point, Chaba, because if, if it's, let's let's say, 20% of the price, but produces 40-50% of the original, then it's worth to buy. Yeah, Especially if there, like there's an aid program for it, then it's even more worse. Yeah, and especially now that uh, the EU and uh, Latin America, or at least Brazil, is is uh, joining uh, this uh, free trade cooperation, so there will be no tariff. So we'll, we'll be able to actually export these um, turbines to, to Brazil without uh, huge tariffs or, or non-tariff barriers. Then it will be a very interesting case. Indeed, I'm, I'm looking forward when, we'll, when this will be signed by all the parties. Because this will be a major change for Brazil. Yeah, I think we are all waiting for that signature. <laughs> I have another comment, but uh, bringing back the discussion for funding, as you mentioned, if it's possible. Uh, I was just checking here, uh, uh, as I explained before, the R&D money that we are allowed to use and uh, the utility companies, they need to invest R&D money into developing uh, innovation. Uh, there, there was a, a small change in the regulation of the money usage that uh, is valid from January 2023 on, and that uh, brings more money to be invested as a as a funding 
like like a like a um, venture capital money. So uh, now the companies they they can use the R and D money to co-invest together with the, with the venture capital, maybe like a CVC or a VC, and uh, this uh, will bring more money to startups to work jointly with the uh, utility companies, I believe. Because one thing is that, as, as I said, we need to support the utility companies in finding new business model because the, the business is heavily regulated. But uh, Saba well mentioned that uh, the companies they are creating like their, their service branch, which is working like new business model, like energy as a service is a new business model that is being worked in the service branch like a, a subsidiary of the utility companies that are vertically integrated. And in that sense, I believe the R&D usage, pouring money on the venture capital together with the venture capital money will support uh, the utility companies to transition from their traditional, traditional and heavily regulated model, maybe to new business model uh, in which the startups have way more speed in testing and, and developing products and, and trying to have like a product market fit way more faster and, and with more flexibility uh, rather than the utility companies trying to do that and uh, managing their customers in a different way that, uh, that is the one that the core business uh, allow them to, to manage. So I believe this will create like a new opportunity or new opportunities for for us to see uh, startups getting more involved with the utility companies especially because i believe we have a huge opportunity here in in the not only on the distributed generation because most part of the distribution generation comes from renewables so it's solar as Xaba well mentioned it's mainly solar Biogas, I think there's a lot of potential because we have a lot of biogas production which can be deployed. And by using that uh, renewable energy, we, we might create like green hydrogen that can be like an export product for Europe. Uh, I think it's a way to export something that is generated by distributed generation in, in like local energy markets. You can have like those uh those type of hydrogen creation being deployed locally like in, in in local energy markets and transforming that renewable energy coming from solar rooftops into hydrogen i think this is viable and then export that to europe to support their transition to be more smooth so i just believe that we need to kind of figure out ways to develop new business models but not having only the Brazilian perspective, uh, but a, a more global perspective and understand what is happening in the energy transition as a whole. For example, energy transition in Brazil is not about uh, renewables. We are 80% renewable country. So it, it could be something more about decarbonization of the matrix, but not our matrix, maybe supporting European countries to decarbonize their own matrix by leveraging green hydrogen. So I think there's a lot of possibilities that can be explored if we use and leverage that relationship that is uh, creating new business model with the utilities to move from their traditional business to new business models. So that's just uh, something to, to add on this discussion here. Yes, thank you. Sometimes I, I, I have the impression that even some European countries, especially the Eastern European ones, can learn uh, from, from examples, from, from best practices, not only from Western Europe, but also from countries like Brazil. Yeah, indeed, Igor. You are really right that there are many ways. And uh, although I'm not a big believer in the green hydrogen, at least not in the, the short run, because uh, that is only viable. I'm an economist, so I, I always see numbers. And uh, of course, the, the not so green hydrogen, the, the, the natural grass uh, reinformation hydrogen is much, much cheaper and uh, much closer is Saudi Arabia than Brazil. So 
uh, it's easier to build a pipeline from Saudi Arabia and that the Saudis actually are building it already. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little challenging, but nevertheless, there are R&D funds and the, the German government is, of course, again, just like he did with the solar 30 years ago now is... Uh, is in the forefront of, of green hydrogen. But I think uh, the solution to, to Renato's question, what will happen with all that uh, doubling of, of distributed generation capacity in three months, of course, it will take two years to be built. But even if it was doubling, uh, the, the solution is two letters, E, V. Uh, electric vehicles will consume about the double of the electricity what we have uh, circulating in the grid today. So it will uh, triplicate the demand if uh, we switch from uh, combustion engine to, to electric engine cars. And all the major uh, car manufacturers announced that from uh, 2030 or latest 2035, they will no longer produce internal combustion engines. So there will be no engines, no cars consuming it. So there will be a huge demand for electricity, uh, not talking about uh, GPs in, in data centers uh, with, with uh, artificial intelligence, but that goes too far. EVs. I agree, this is a real challenge. Are there any more comments? Uh, the audience was quite silent, but I'm very happy that the panelists were quite active. And I think sometimes it's very good to listen to you who are the specialists in, in, in this topic. Uh, some other comments, ideas, inputs? If not, in this case, uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for all who, who participated and were interested in this topic. And uh, please be aware that there will be further innovation talks on behalf of the Enrich in Latin America project. Please be with us, have a look on our website, cooperate with us. I think it's first to cooperate in the future. And as I mentioned it uh, previously, I, I said it to the energy market, to renewable energies, but in general, for international cooperation. In our, our case, uh, it is a mission. And uh, for us, uh, cooperation is the first instead of competition. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Zita. Bye bye. Thank you. See you thank next you time. Thank you, Zita. Thank, thank you, you all. for the invitation. Thank you for bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.